completers, the everyone. Um, my name is Olwen, I'm the creative producer at UKNA, and I am really pleased to introduce this talk with Ione Smallhorn, um, who is an amazing spoken word artist and works um, a lot with archives and draws from them in her practice. We are going to have a Q&A after the talk as well. Um, so as we go along, if you have any questions, please bank them and then we'll come back. But for the moment, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Ione. Oh. <laughs> so good evening to the people in person and good evening to the people who will be online somewhere in the future. <laughs> um, your presence is really welcomed. Um, so yes, I am Ione. I'm a performance poet, poet, writer. Um, and I'm going to be sharing a bit about, a bit about my practice today, um, about who I am. So yes, I am a multitude of things. A woman, a writer, a poet, um, educator, sister, auntie. Well, I should hold this up. I'll hold this with me, so I might need it. Um, I'm from Nottingham, a Nottingham native. From Jamaica, I have Jamaican heritage. Both sides of my family are Jamaican. I am neurodivergent, I'm working class. I have all these things. And um, yes, I'm going to be sharing a bit about who I am and how I write today. I'm also the granddaughter of Miss Ramdas, a Jamaican Indian woman who dared to fight the confinements of her fishing village with hook and with crook. And I'm the granddaughter of Miss Rachel Kitty Lewis, an entrepreneurial, chance-taking African Jamaican woman who soaked the hard lines of rules until they were soft like the kidney beans in a Sunday rice and peas. In my blood hear the sound of the abeng instigating mutiny and defiance. Through my multidisciplinary practice, um, my intention is always, mostly always, not always, yeah, mostly always, <laughs> is um, to centre the black female experience, to interrupt the commonly health um, stereotypes, perceptions, to celebrate our joys, our rage, our resilience, our flaws, our misgivings, um, and to add to the body of work that is currently being constructed by my creative peers, around the world. Um, so yeah, my, res my creative practice and my research practice mirrors my multidisciplinary-ness. Um, it takes many forms and often involves attending live music events, um, conversations, analysing, text, academic essays, photographs, personal experiences, but museums and archives do play an important role they're like, a, they're like, a, um, like a, a vital organ in the body of my work. Um, that's how I like to see them. So today I will share how archives and museums have um, helped shape my writing. This will be part talk, part poetry sharing. So um, buckle up. <laughs> Let's go for the ride. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tongues, hips and multi-purpose machetes. I'm from a mother tongue that refused to forget West Africa. A tongue strong enough to withstand English correction houses, loose and appropriated by teenagers from Hucknall who have renamed their friend Bredgin. I'm from an island where ladies have inflated hips, like globular, oscillating power tools, marinating African ritual, and dance hall. I'm from the fear of Obi women and Aki, from the surname of plantation owners and white Jesus, translating biblical scriptures from Pokemania to revivalism and hailing Rastafari. I'm from sugarcane, from revolts ignited by the sound of the abeng echoing over hilltops, I'm one of 36,000 indentured Indians, travelling 
from a depot in Calcutta to work for one shilling a day, to be charged two shillings to eat, and from a thumbprint that so, that so innocently signed away my language and my religion. I'm from ganja, chilling pipes, dal and roti. I'm from handed down black and Dutch pots, yam grown in backyards and grated and dried cassava. Hand carts made from broken chairs and empty polished tins become their wheels. I'm from a place where condensed milk tins are crafted into lanterns, filled with kerosene, burnt to brighten country darkness. Where huge truck tyres become tiny roundabouts. I'm from pimento and scotch bonnet, encasing meat in pit fires and multi-purpose machetes. I travel through the floodgates, rebuilt Britain after the war. I'm a wind rush follower, greeted with the hostile saliva of the frightened unemployed. I'm from grandma's wage packet that stretched across the Atlantic to feed and clothe an eight-year-old boy who would grow into my dad. I'm from Lala Rachel, who feared her brother wouldn't send for her, so she wore a dress two sizes too big to hide the surprise in her belly. I'm the daughter of that surprise. So, what is an archive? So the dictionary Definition would have you believe it's a noun, and I, I agree. It's a noun, um, housing documents, records, related to activities, business, dealings, a person's family, corporation, association, community, or nation. Yeah, a place where public records are held and maintained and cared for. Um, but what is it really? What is an archive to me as an artist, as a writer, as a performer. Um, I suppose an, ar an archive and museums, for me, and each piece in that um, archive and museum is like an extract from a novel, or a section of a map, or a bone belonging to a skeleton. That's how I see each piece in an archive or museum, okay? It's um, snippets of people's lives, aren't they? They're like little clues that have been left that you have to add, um, add your imagination to, to bring it to life. So you can't just be the thing. It has to be matched with your imagination, your personal connection. Then it becomes a bigger thing. Then you actually connect with that person's life who you belonged to, right? Um, so yeah, so each time I see a piece from an archive or a museum, um, it's like, it's inviting me to add flesh to the bone, yeah? to go on that journey, take that piece of the map and follow, follow it and then take it where I want to go from that piece to a new destination or travel back to where it came from, right? Um, and finding characters that, can, that I can build a narrative arc from. So, so that's how I see items in an archive. Um, and I chose this picture quite Specifically, you know, all these plain white boulders, and let's let's be honest. Like most archives and, and museums are curated and managed by white middle class people. Um, not to say white middle class people are all bad; they're fine. <laughs> but um, diversity is is important to me. Um, so we have to remember as well. With that said, who who gets to label things? Who gets to choose what is important? Who gets to categorise things? Or not? Are they using their personal experience? How, how can they categorise for diverse people? Um, these are questions that I like to throw up. And I like to think about when I'm seeing something in an archive and I'm thinking, OK, someone's chosen to, to store this, but what about this? Is this not worthy as well? Or maybe they didn't realise, or maybe it wasn't given. So there's always that conversation. You need to have an air of... Um, <coughs> I like to challenge things. <laughs> I like to challenge things um, by nature, really. Um, and also, I think it's important to remember that you know these artifacts and items are clues into history. Um, but history belongs to no one and belongs to everyone at the same time. Okay, so if there's ten people, if you ask ten people about a an event, like there's one, two, three, four. There's about nearly ten people in this room. Can't count that quick. But if if 
At the end of this event, if someone asked you, what was this event about? Each one of you would have a different experience or some slightly different perspective on things, right? And each one of you are right. So, um, so when we're thinking about archives and museums and how things are collected and how things are described and how things are categorised, um, that's one person's way of categorising it. So as an artist, I often might recategorise it for my purposes. Okay. So working with archives, I I have worked with archives in various capacities. Um, so in when I was nineteen, I I, I left Nottingham um, under the guise of going to uni, but really we know what that means, don't we? We just want to like escape the confinements of our parents as gays. <laughs> we just want to like escape from it and go raving, which I did do, but I did get to uni as well. That's, I have a degree and I'm like, it's fine, mom. <laughs> I, did, I did go to lectures, right? <laughs> so yeah, I studied um, TV and film production. Um, but I was kind of lack King, I, I was kind of still yearning for more, like, I didn't really get the connection to the black communities there. So I volunteered to work with the Black Cultural Archive when it was in its transitionary period, before it is where it is today, on um, Windrush Square. It was, you know, while that was building was being built, it was in this other building on Cold Harbour Lane, and I, I just used to go down there and volunteer my time to sit there and it's just a good excuse to see more of the things, really, um, and talk to people about it as well, because sometimes when you see something, you're limited to your own brain, but when you have guests and people coming in each time and sharing their perspectives on things, it, it enlarges your perspective, right? So I sat there, did that for like two years. Every other day or once a week, I'll go there and volunteer my time. And also, um, Years, fast forwarding years later to 2011, I, um, with my TV filmmaking degree, which I, which I obtained from going to lectures, mum, I did go, um, I, I worked with Nottingham Black Archive as the um, documentary filmmaker, and we made, so all these images, well, not all of them, most of them, are from projects that, um, we did, I worked on um, documenting the experiences of black servicemen in the Second World War, First World War as well. Um, local communities, local activists that helped to um, establish black organisations in Nottingham and formed political activism movements and get things going for black folk in Nottingham. And that was a really important um, time for me. I was there with Nottingham Black Archive for seven years. And it was a really, it really helped me to ground myself more in, because I lived in Nottingham my whole, most majority of my life, grew up there. But when, when you really talk, and you, you talk to people all the time in the street, like, hi, ah, how are you, whatever, but as a documentary maker, and through the Nottingham Black Archive, um, we sat down with the intention of, let's talk about this, you know, and really framing these um, mostly elderly black people's experiences. And it made them, oh, it gave them some importance, where otherwise they were, maybe didn't think things were that interesting. I'm like, yes, you go, you, you know, going, being a RAF pilot is really interesting. If you're a, a black man, um, a black Chinese Jamaican, that's really interesting. Um, but I, I think maybe because they, life takes over, doesn't it? You tend to think, oh, your life's not interesting. But it is. Well, people's lives are very interesting. To me, they, I, I find it fascinating, these people's lives. So it was lovely to see these people walk around that community, but have like secret agents, like dig, dig a bit further and they have this really interesting, meandering life that they are housing in their body. So um, it was really a fascinating time for me. And then also I worked quite recently with the National Civil War Centre, just down the road really, isn't it? Um, 
I knew from Trent, um, working with the educational team to engage young people, get them involved with their local history and to have a personal, on a personal level, yeah, to engage with history on a personal level. So that was, well, again, quite fascinating. So that's me working with archives as, um, without being a writer. It's always kind of been embedded in me, interest, this interest in people's lives and finding stories, um, important, being, being drawn to people's life stories has always been a part of my, who, who I am, basically. So, which brings me to Jamaica and her daughters. Um, it's hard to say when I started this project, actually. I was trying to think when to say it started. You could say when I was born. You could say when the first woman in, the line in my family lineage was born. It could be, I don't know, when I started my MA. But it's, um, Jamaica and Her Daughters is a collection of poems and prose that um, I suppose chart the, what, what, what have I written here, Ione? What you written? A collection of poetry and prose charting the female experience of Jamaica and her diaspora over the past 500 years. Yes, that quite succinctly says what, I'm, what it is, and it is. Um, it's a sprawling project that has consumed me and probably existed before I have existed. So I'm interested in looking at you know, women's experiences who lots of people don't know about, even Jamaican people, or people of Jamaican heritage. Who? Did that happen? Taino women, the, the women that were indigenous there, the indigenous people of the land before the Europeans came. African enslaved women, the, the Indian, Indian and Chinese indentured labourers, the Irish and English pirates, the Obia women, the preachers' wives, the Higler market women, these, all these women are really fascinating. And um, this is a project that I'm currently working on and um, which I'll be sharing some work from now on will be from this project. And I visited quite a few um, museums and archives. Here's a list of some. I've, I've had to make a list, and I've, I know I've forgotten some. I have. But so far, British Newspaper Archive, Gleaner Archives, Caribbean Photo Archive, Lambert Archive, BBC Archives, International Slavery Museum, London Dockland Museum, National Archives, Imperial War Museum, National Maritime Museum, Autograph, and loads more, and um, I imagine I'll be adding to that list as I write more and, have that, and as I research more. Um, so I had a sharing of this project, a work in progress sharing earlier this year in February in the Arts Exchange as I was the artist in residence. And my writing, as you can probably tell by Jamaica and her daughters, um, it's a, it's a mixture of the personal and the political, of the social, on the, of the economical, everything in, intertwined, mixed and blended where it blows. Um, I'm going to share the first scene of the one woman show that I'm writing on this. It might give you, help you to be grounded in that environment. Um, Escaping Bull Bay. Each pebble is a tombstone. Stories of the dead preserved in brine. The darkness, solid and sprawling. Leaving only a ye yellow sickle moon as witness. Its light flickers across the Caribbean seas and all your body, grabbing what it can off the coast, then retreating like a thief. I'm running. I have no shoes, no money, no phone. He's getting closer, I'm running. Through the smell of salt and rotting seaweed, using the curve of the coast to escape, my, to guide my escape. Along the winding country road, my naked souls scrambling over the sea cemetery. Crab claws, stones, broken turtle shells, bones. I have no time to pay respects for their lives. I'm running for my own. 
Two weeks before, I sat along that same coast, tied rocks to my feet, bartered with the sea, my body to feed some worthy sea creature for peace of mind. But things have changed now. A creature was stirred within me, greedy for space, for air, and it growled. A thread had knotted around the creature's claws, the same thread tied to the tide. Tugging and rising, tugging and rising, tugging and rising. The same thread was stitched into every cricket singing, each firefly burning for me. I felt everything now. And I swear, I swear I see Nana Rachel. Well, not see her, but feed her. That thread connecting me to all the dead, distant relatives I've never met or don't know the names of. The ball rhythm, yanking at that thread, pulling, like pulling a wreckage from the depths. I feel faster, lighter, as if my body had been halved, or maybe I left it behind with him. A car's headlight pierces the night, speeds past, stops, reverses, until by my side, the woman winds down the window. Suspicious, she scrutinises my scrawny, scratched body. Billy said in stone. Snot and tears smeared across my face, my um, vest on backwards, my jeans unzipped. I'm a mess, yeah, I'm a mess. But I'm not dead. Yeah! Is where I go. This time of night. What happened to you? I get in. The car speeds away. I slam the door. I don't look back. And I watch this island flicker past my window. I put together a timeline. And I'm, I'm neurodivergent. I'm dyslexic. So sometimes holding lots of information in my head. Even for non-neurodivergent people, holding 500 years of history in your head. <laughs> I don't know if you can do it, right? But... So what helped me was to, to create a time, literal, a physical timeline of essays, with photographs, with thoughts, with um, drawings, um, newspaper articles, and I, I started um, at around 1600s to present day, and each decade I just slapped on um, pictures. You can see this is parts of it um, for the sharing that I had a new art exchange earlier this year. And it helped me just to visualise the history and how I fit into it. Um, so that was a bit of how I think. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Um, okay, I can't remember. We were Naomi. <laughs> so um, another thing: voices from the archive. That's what it's supposed to say. So. Looking at Jamaica and her daughters, I, I've um, visited, visited many archives. Um, I really like the newspaper, the national, the British newspaper library or archive. I, I could spend hours in there. Um, and I'm going to share with you a newspaper cutting that I have found. Um, the anti-slavery reporter, June the 2nd, 1841, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to share a little extract. So before I do, I'll give you some backstory. So you might have been heard about Oliver Cromwell. Most people have heard at school, if, you, if you're educated in England or any other um, place that's been colonised by England, <laughs> you might have heard about Oliver Cromwell. You might have heard whispers of the in, um, Irish indentured labourers or the Irish influence on Jamaica, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But um, if you do, that's about it, isn't it? You hear, oh yeah, there was some Irish involvement, I think Oliver Cromwell sent some Irish people there. And that's all you really tend to hear. But that's not enough for me. Because these people, had, these were people, right? These had lives, they had dreams and hopes and fears. So I, I dug, as I do, and um, I'm interested in, in researching the Irish um, population in, in Jamaica, especially between the 17 and 1900s. Um, 
So we know about all these, the, the, sometimes statistics and numbers, how many people were carried there, but who were the people, who were they? So I found one, I found one woman called Anna Glynn. She was travelled with her sister. She was, um, she was illiterate. Um, she came from, I can't do I can read this. The writing is really, really tiny. Um, but Anna Glynn and her, and her sister were 15 and 16, and um, Oliver Cromwell was rounding up, sending various um, agents, I don't know the proper word for it, there was a name, I can't remember what it is now, call them agents, men, sending men, <laughs> to go to Ireland and rounding up um, usually poor Irish people, um, maybe um, usually, uh, many were of the travelling community, um, rounding them up, do you want work? Yeah, I want some work. You might think, oh, it's in England or something, but um, obviously they, a lot of them were illiterate, they couldn't read the contract, they didn't know where they were going or ending up, but they ended up in Jamaica, right? Um, there's lots of Irish people that ended up as um, plantation owners or some sort of managers as well, because um, the governors of Jamaica at that time wanted white ruling class, so they went, Oliver Cromwell thought, oh, I'll just ship them across. So, um, Anna Glynn, Anna Glynn, she thought she was going to have work, thought she was going to get paid um, nine shillings a week, but it wasn't the case. And when she went to Jamaica, Black River, which is the south part of Jamaica, I'm trying to read this article. Um, I'm going to try and read an ex excerpt from it. So, Anna Glynn, she, she was taken to Jamaica, taken to this Compton Lodge in Black River by a BM Senior Esquire and Honor Glynn. So this is a court, a reporter's, um, <laughs> a court report. Because Honor Glynn didn't like it and she was a bit feisty, I like a bit Honor. She, she just ran off. Went, no, I'm not staying there, this isn't what I agreed to. So, but they caught her and I sent her to court and she had to stand up in court. So he was saying, um, this is what the reporter said. Um, in the case before the court, he was prepared to produce documents to show that he was the defiant, was doubly bound, first in London and then on her arrival in Jamaica. Both documents were then produced. So, um, Mr whoever there was, where's the name, can't read it. So he was trying to say, she's my property, she belongs to me, you get her back home, and that's it. Anna was like having none of it. Um, the first dated London, six, 16th of December, 1840, with the mark of Honor Glynn attached, so as a thumbprint, to say that she didn't write. Her thumbprint was on this contract, apparently. Purported that she had engaged in London with H. Hendrix, to proceed to Compton Lodge, Jamaica, to serve B. M. Senior as a labourer. The document is not attested, neither does it appear that it is ever read to her before she attached her cross to it. So, she's taken the man's word for it. She's a 16 year old girl, poor, wanting to feed her family, thinking, yeah, I need some work. The contract wasn't read to her. She just put a thumbprint on it and she was shipped off to Jamaica. Well, London first, then to Jamaica. Right. Later signed by B. M. Senior, with with the cross of honour being attached. Sorry, I said that bit already. Um, a few days after arrival in the ship Marlborough at Black River, the purport it being that Honor Glynn was to serve B. M. Senior at Compton Lodge as general servant indoors for three years, wage wages nine sterling per annum with the allowances in the shape of provisions to, to amount four shillings, right? And to be furnished with comfortable room and expenses outfits. That's what it was supposed to happen. That never happened. Well, according to Anna, I believe Anna, I believe Anna Glynn, if I'm honest. I'm on her side. And um, basically, she was like, she replied that she would rather be in jail for her three years then remain in Compton Lodge. She then went away and have not been seen ever since. Go on, girl. So she, she legged it, basically. She legged it. And it goes on. It's really hard for me to read. 
But um, that's for me. That's what archives are for. That's what archives are for. Yeah, we know about on it. We know about Oliver Cromwell, and yeah, he shipped some Irish people there. That's not the end of the story. That is the beginning of a story. On a glim, one to her sister. Where did she go? She was sixteen. Um, so um, I plan to use that um, and to write poems and writing from. <sighs> So here's some more, um, putting flesh on the bones. So um, I found out about these two female pirates that were operating in the Caribbean in 1700s, Anne Bonnet and, Anne Bonnet and Mary Reed, English and Irish pirates operating in, just said that. So when I went to the London Dockland Museum and the National Maritime, yeah, Maritime Museum, um, Daddy's pictures, it was a little small. Sometimes the things I find aren't huge things. You have to be prepared to look between the lines and, and to, you know, plus there was these images. I think it was actually an exhibition in London Maritime Museum, but I missed that. So I just saw a little like excerpt from it. And then at London Duckland Museum as well, there was a, a picture. And I was like, who are these? Who are these women? Female pirates in Jamaica. Um, so I dug around, did some research. And, you know, when you read research, again, I'm, I'm trying to take that lens off, like, mostly written by men, especially back in the day, in these times, 1700s, by affluent men, men who had ulterior motives, like, were they being truthful? Is this the, their perspective? These drawings were by men. If they were drawn by women, would, would they be showing their breasts? Maybe not. This is a male gaze we're looking at. So I'm really interested in, in trying to read between the male gaze and the mainstream. It's hard because I, I wasn't there. I don't know anyone who knows them. So I have to use my imagination. Um, so I researched lots of sea shanties and there was, a, there was an archive. It's, not, it's an archive for everything. You'd be, you'd be amazed, right? In, I want to say, Boston, there was, a, there was a museum and archive of sea shanties and I really researched how to write sea shanties, right? So um, I was determined, I'm going to write a sea shanty for Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. So just a bit of background to these two characters. Um, so Mary Reed, she was Irish and she got married. I think her parents were ill, sick, died. So ended up getting married to this guy who um, went to America's, to South Carolina, and she, for whatever reason, I get the impression he doesn't, wasn't really caring for her, looking after her well, maybe some domestic violence. And she was like, I'm not having this, I'm off. So um, she joined some pirates. <laughs> she, she just went, she went, she, some pirates knocked on the door, I don't know how it happened, I don't know, <laughs> sailed by, and she goes, all right. Like, can I get on your boat? I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing. Um, I'm guessing it wasn't so romanticised. It wasn't so lovely and pretty as research would have you think. I'm, I'm guessing it was quite horrific, actually. Um, but they both dressed as men. <laughs> well, and um, Mary had to dress up as a man because on, on a pirate ship, I, I don't imagine women, I don't know. But they had to conceal they were, they were women. So they dressed as men, but they found each other on the same pirate ship, apparently, and they were actually hard. They would like take down man and fight them and they were the hardest of the, of the crew. So I wrote this sea shanty, outward bound sea shanty. I'm not gonna sing it today because my story is a little, so I'm just gonna <laughs> read it. They sailed the high seas, escaped the boundaries of their milk white breast. They fired pistol, carried cutlass and infants in the West Indies amongst the sea's bravest. Dressed in men's jacket, skilled with a hatchet, they could handle any ship, storm or sailor. Bonnie and Reed, two full-bodied women in white trouser, oh, you better pray to your saviour. Pirates with Captain Jack Rackman, they were the bravest of his crew. Brigantine, sloop or merchant ship, many plundered, many overthrew. 
When Jack's ship was attacked by King's order, they drank too much rum, had too much folly. Not one man did fight, not one man did sober. Brave Bonnie and Reed slew the pistol and machete. On trial for murder in St. Jago de la Vega, the three were sentenced to be hanged. Bonnie and Reed pleaded their swollen bellies, and all for the buccaneers they sang. In old Port Royal, Jack hung above hot soil. Bonnie's last word to her lover were, My dear, if you fought like a woman, you wouldn't hang like a dog. And then she sailed as a buccaneer. Yeah, I love her. They sailed the high seas, escaped the boundaries to escape Oh, escape the boundaries of their milk white breast and executioner. With an unborn insider, Reed died of fever, but still the king's men never killed her. Um, there we go. So I I'm, I'm want to write so much more about these two women. Because um, even that poem I wrote, I'm always questioning myself, like, Am I downplaying life? I mean, that's quite a jolly look beat, but I imagine life wasn't so. But it's hard, you know, when, you, when you've got these images and a few little lines. And so this is where archives come in handy. You have to research the, the, the wider life of pirates. Like I had to dig down some research and find out about um, captain um, different sea shanties and their purpose and their outward sea shanty and the inward bound and how you of a sail and all these things. But also the, the political time for pirates then, what were they doing? What was the relationship with England and the, the um, monarchy and all these things? And then after you read all that, piece together your imagination what life was like for them. So it takes time, it takes time. So there's gonna be many more poems about these two fine women. Right, moving on. Oh, how are we for time? Am I okay for time? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. I can go on forever. So, Mimba's Hands, this is a really um, quite interesting story, actually. So, I was. So, yeah, we've just been looking at the pirates, 1700s. So, the same kind of time, maybe a bit before, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, they. Um, Sugar plantations were churning out money, churning out sugar from the labour of um, African enslaved people, mostly. Later on, it was um, Indian indentured, Chinese indentured people as well. Um, and I was looking at the process of making sugar back in these times. What, what was, because we, we, we hear the surface, the crust of, of what slavery was, but I wanted, as a poet, I like the fine details, I like the specifics. What was it, what did they actually have to do? So I researched the process of making sugar from the plantations in these times, and I went on to Liverpool Museum, um, Liverpool Museum, um, Slavery Museum, Liverpool Slavery Museum, okay? Um, they had this on their website, I didn't actually go there, because um, this was during lockdown, I think. Yeah, from lockdown. So I looked on their website and they had the whole process of how um, sugar came from, was, was planted, was, um, went to the, the mills, the curing house. And these are some images here from the Caribbean photo archive, that picture on the left. And these images here, I think from the British Library. Um, and they have this, this paragraph here, an enslaved woman called Mimba, who was in her late 30s and 40s, had her hands ground off, probably when feeding cane into the mill on William Stapleton's plantation in Nevis. So it was in Nevis, not Jamaica, um, but still, that struck a chord with me. Her hands were ground off, and um, it had Hold information, and apparently during the, the mill and the curing house, they used to have um, an enslaved person standing by, this was their health and safety, standing by with a machete in case they were pulled into the mill. Sorry, there's a warning. Sorry, the warning's too late, isn't it? It's, it's too soon. <laughs> Sorry, there should have been a warning before, like when I said hello, good evening. Sorry, it's going to get gruesome. There we go, that's the warning. So, <laughs> so, so, 
their health and safety. So to prevent the whole body going in, there were some of them with sharpened machete who would just chop the hands off. Um, and often, again, we see these images and we, we kind of detach from it, right? It kind of, the paintings. But when you see the photographs, so these images came later on, um, which I'll go into, but um, from um, 18... Um, 70 onwards, when the Henry Blake, the British governor of Jamaica at that time, wanted to, to show Jamaica as a prosperous place. This is after slavery had been abolished, but um, the plantations were going into ruin and had a bad reputation. So Henry Blake, governor, wanted to, um, you wanted to market Jamaica as a, as a holiday tourist attraction to wealthy European people, Americans at that time. So he sent photographers to the Caribbean um, to Jamaica to take photographs of people working hard because apparently people didn't work hard enough in Jamaica. So that's where these photographs came from. So these photographs wouldn't have been the same time. Is, is my is that working? Okay. Yeah. These photographs wouldn't be in the same time of Mimba was alive because Mimba was alive in the 1700s. But these photographs did give me some sort of entry point into looking into the faces of these women. I mean, I can look at my grandma or my mum and see the face of these women, but closer to the time, these are the women, and it really struck a chord. So I wrote a short story called Mimba's Hands, <coughs> which I'll share with you right now. So this is Mimba's Hands, directly from that. That's all I read, and I thought, right, I'm going to write about you, Mimba. You deserve it, love. At the start of hurricane season, when the sun sinks into the horizon, Mimba searches for her hands, her arms bleeding at the elbow, where Miss Violet Cutlass amputated her crushed bones, clean, clean, quick, sharp. The mill tequi her hand, but Miss Vi see her body, bound her arms tight with rum to prevent infection. Mimba was a mill feeder. She guided Cain into the greedy grounding mouths of wooden rollers, motivated by the revolving sails, steady and constant, proclaiming wealth and industry, pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling, Cain back and forth, extracting every last penny of juice. The skill was knowing when to let go but skilled people get tired. Now, Mimba encircles the old mill like how oxen once did, pulling treadmills in harvest season to aid production when the wind was bound, their hooves a muted metronome beating the ground. The wind carries her voice as she laments the old cane cutter's song. Me one go river, Lord, river run free. Work never do no lad, oh, if I run free. If I cut through earth and stone, oh, if I run free. If I flow and find his home, oh, if I take me. Her, her truncated arms leaving a bloody trail. With a bullet lodged in her forehead, Mimba circles and searches, he circles and searches, he circles and sings. The other enslaved people of Pleasant Hill left kerosene lamps and cups of rum, rum to ease her efforts. Then the frightened for Mimba. Mimba, I fear our people then. It was overseer John who had to fear. Old slaves weed the fields, pick the slaves, catch the rats, the strand plant and harvest, the skilled work the mill and curing house. What use is a slave with no hands? And that him say, before, despite, before he shot her, despite member having his child, May. And that one trouble start for him, when member dead. Each time he rode his horse drawn cart to check the field workers. He saw hands instead of cane. The long stalks like bones of fingers, their knotted nodes like knuckles, the cane cutters chopping and chopping, leaving short stubs and her blood would spill.
spill and her blood would spill and her blood would spill over and over in his mind. Mad madness, take him! Madness began to feast on him like the maggots of a like maggots in a starved mongrel left to rot in the day's heat. He'd wake up in the dark belly of night, digging with hoe, searching for her hands. Then, then he started digging bare face. In the day, under the ferocity of the sky's fire, like a field slave, I remember his overseer, and she make him walk. And I heard her singing, and the beat of the oxen hooves, and the wiring sails, day and night, they don't stop. We won't go with our Lord, with our own free. Word never done no Lord, oh, with our own free. He would cry to the doctor, his prescriptions proved no remedy for Master John's failing mind. Suspicious, May and Miss Violet awoke all be upon him. He ordered fifty lashes from Miss V. May was sold to the doctor's friend. Soon, soon he started seeing Mimba's hands on his plate instead of the nice, nice food he's so accustomed to eat him. Until he stopped eating and found dead. In the mill, no hands. The old mill on Pleasant Hill, with time, disappeared under creeping vine, its stone walls crumbling, a fragmented structure, like the past and memories of home, <coughs> like the families of enslaved people, like the languages they forbade us to speak. So as you can see, I've added a lot of flesh to that story. Yeah, and that story came from those images and that. Um, but it's the imagination <coughs> that has to bring alive that image, that story. Okay. So another entry point into archives is um, through journals and essays. Uh, for my MA, my dissertation was where this project start, I started writing for this project. I had to research a lot and lot and lot. Read lots of essays, journals, all sorts. Um, and although, you know, these online platforms like such as Taylor and Francis, as Gestor, they, they house lots of these essays. In a sense, I suppose there are archives in a, in a, in a, in a sense. But um, what I found when reading lots of journals is that they had images um, maps, and then in their citations, they would they would cite where they found that from, and then that would lead me to go to that particular archive or museum or wherever and 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 find that for myself and find more. So it's like those clues, like I said before like at the start of this talk about how you know you left these items are like clues or like a part of a map that you just found, and you have to kind of <coughs> follow your way through and add bits until you get to the destination. This is one of the clues and how I found it, found things through. Um, this particular, particular essay was um, by Fenola O'Kane in 2018, The Irish Jamaican Plantation of Kelly's Pen, Jamaica, Caribbean Quarterly. So I use that journal, Caribbean Quarterly, quite heavily during my research. Um, and you can see there's maps there of how old Jamaica used to be. Um, itinerary. So that was an itinerary of this particular plantation, Kelly's Pen, and it listed the things they owned, <coughs> sorry, the things they owned, as in like spoons, um, crockery, doors, may, quashiba, and people all lined together there. So, and this inspired a next poem I'm going to read. Um, and also, from this next poem, it's called Life on Eden. And um, sometimes, how do I describe this? So, you know, I, I spoke earlier about how things are categorised in, in museums and, and archives, right? And they have, they have to be quite succinct because they've got lots of information and they can't write a whole, you know, people haven't got time to just get the category number and then the, um, the item or the artefact, what it is. Um, just how the itinerary is 
a lot of museums, your know, archives, when you, you, you flick them through their things, it's like, a, it's like an itinerary like that. So it actually inspired the form of this poem. I wrote it as an itinerary. Um, so it reads like this. I'll just read a part of it because it's, it's very long. Life on Eden, aged two months, 1780, Sylvia gave birth to a baby boy who died a week later, and Black Betty's daughter Flora died aged two after vomiting fever. Washer Kate gave birth in 1872 to a daughter who died a month later, followed by Sylvia's second baby who died hour after birth. When Mandingo Hannah's five-year-old daughter Phoebe died of locked jaw, and later the same year she was lost she lost a baby aged two weeks. Damsel's mulatto child for the doctor's son, aged three months old, on the last day of the year, died. Black Betty's baby boy died, one week old, 1784. Annie's baby died from childbed. Annie's, Annie died a week later. 1785, Koshiba, aged four years old. Koshiba's son, Sorry, 1785, Koshiba's four-year-old son died from yours, from Yao's, after the doctor prescribed mercury pills. The same year, Field Mary's mulatto daughter, Lola, died six months old from fever. Nanny's six-year-old son, Abraham, was caught eating stolen corn, died from injuries of punishment. The same year, Sylvia's mulatto daughter of the doctor, aged 18 months, died. Members four-year-old daughter Bella died after supposedly eating dirt. In 18, 1787, Bessie's three-year-old daughter Daphne died from fever, malnutrition. Sally's baby died the day after. So I will say, doing this project, as you, as I've explained, it's a personal and political journey, and um, it's moving. I think when you see these items, or you see these little excerpts of, um, excerpts of catalog numbers and things, each one is a person. So even if you go into any museum and you find someone's clothing <coughs> or so it's a person, and um, this is what I'm trying to bring, breathe back life into history um, through my work. Okay. So what have I got for you next? So read all about it, or what the journalist has reported, build in the gaps. <laughs> so going back to the British Newspaper Library, the Kentish town, oh yeah, so I, I really enjoy using the British Newspaper Library. Newspapers are strange things, aren't they? Um, headlines and, you know, it has to be catchy to, to grab an audience, to grab a, re to grab a readership. And also the language throughout history, you can kind of hear the political um, agendas at that time, how things, you know, how, how they phrased things. It's really interesting. So, what time are we on? Okay, not much to go now. So I, right, so the, on the right hand side, which I, I probably won't read because it's really, really tiny and I'm not sure I actually brought it with me, if I'm honest, that's the real reason. I think I've just forgot it, I just remembered. But on the right hand side, there is a, um, a, a page for our newspaper, the Kentish Gazette, um, Tuesday 9th of April 1866. And this is after um, slavery was abolished in England, or so-called abolished, so they say. Um, but they still needed people to work, so and the, the conditions of, of the people on the island, African people, were still terrible. So there was an uprising, the Morant Bay uprising, um, in a quite horrific affair. I mean, all of Jamaica's history, it's not very, <laughs> it's not very glowing and rosy, is it? So, yeah, it's, it continues to be horrific. But this particular um, article was, was talking about, have I got it here? It was talking about um, 
a lady called Sarah Robinson, who was taken to court to, be, to give evidence about what she saw about the Morant Bay uprisings. And she concocted some fictitious story. It was the most amazing thing. When I read it, I was like, is this, is this true? And I, I, think, I think there's some truth in it. Um, sorry I've never brought it with me. So basically, she was just trying to give them the runaround. Um, but it's this way that and, oh, the journalists reported it. And you have to kind of read between the lines as, as a black woman, as someone who's got Jamaica in her veins, we have to read between the lines of the Eurocentric um, male, usually, gaze, and just get the gold. <laughs> Same way through Anna Glynn, you know, you can, you can feel the fire through the, through the pages, so that's something I've been returning to, to write about. Um, good old Sarah Robinson, sending, giving them the wrong amount. Um, and on the left, you'll see Bob Marley, Cinder Bridge, Cindy Breakspear, who was Miss World, and, and um, Rita Marley, Bob's wife. So, what did I want to say about this? Here we go. So yeah, I saw an article in the um, British newspaper archive, and it was around like in the 70s. So after Bob Marley was shot in Jamaica, right, he came to live in England, in London, where he began a relationship with Cindy Breakspear, who was Miss World at that time. And they lived in Chelsea, posh part of town, posh part of London. Yeah, and this article had, was like, you know, I think that was a, actually a picture from one of the articles. I should have got the picture of the whole spread, but basically it was saying, headline, Bob is going with Miss World and blah, 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 while his wife's back home. But, you know, after the wife's back home, after he's got shot, she's been shot as well, she's actually caught in the hospital. But the, the picture they used of Rita Marley in the newspaper was wrong. It wasn't her. Just a random black woman. I'm like, that's not Rita Marley. So sometimes I get things wrong. <laughs> but again, that's laid down in history. It's just there, isn't it? Like, it shows how much they really cared about Rita. So after reading that article and seeing the, the mishap with the, the images, I was like, I'm going to write a poem to, meet, to Rita, imagining I was Rita's friend. Um, what time? It's 8 o'clock. Okay. Um, a few more, then I'll, then I'll stop. Rita, you have a bullet with Bob's name on it, lodged in your head. He's now living in Chelsea with Miss World. Is this love? Rita, do you think he remembers the shanty town on tracks on dirt roads? High wind, heavy rain, zinc roofs and wooden shack, meat patty and cocoa bread and bottled soda? You'd, you'd sing under the plum tree in your yard, share your first ripe fruit with him, with Nyabingi and Mento. Guitars made from sardine cans, hands washing his jeans with blue soap. The papers have captured some random black woman as his wife. You kept on swaying on stage, your voice a, a safe bed for his. Were you an instrument he played while they admired his girlfriend's pretty hair? Remember. It was your thick, natty roots that prevented that bullet from rupturing your skull. Rita! Okay. It's me trying to say, Rita, leave the man. But he's Bob Marley. Would I, would I leave Bob Marley? I don't know if I would, if I'm honest. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. But anyway. Um, so, whizzing through now. I'm going to be wrapping up shortly. But I also went to Lambert's archives um, to, to research... Um, Olive Morris, because Jamaica and her daughters isn't just about women in Jamaica, it's about the diaspora, women like me, my, my parents, um, Olive Morris. It's often forgotten in history, in um, generally in history, but I wanted to awaken her voice. So I went to Lambeth Archive and it was the most beautiful time. They have this um, wonderful collection of newspaper cuttings, photographs, letters, handwritten letters her old class books or everything in there. But what I was drawn to was interviews by her friends and family and lovers, and lover, I should say. Sorry, easy on him. Um, and it enabled me to, I plugged it in, and I could hear their voice. <coughs> Sorry. And it's something about hearing these people's voice talking about someone who's passed on now. But you, you, get, you hear them choking up, you hear them coughing, you hear them laughing, you hear their life. And it really, it was really, um, 
inspiring and humanizing. You know, often we see Olive Morris as some political activists, images like this, which are quite two-dimensional, not just because it's on a paper, but because it's not letting people in. Like, what was it like for a black activist in the in 70s? Um, and there's this beautiful interview with a friend who was just talking about their friendship, some um, memories of Olive. So this is the voice of a friend. I wrote a short poem. When miscarried, bruised from the loss, Olive plaited my hair in singles, back against the settee, grief held by the warmth of her legs. She parted so softly laughter and tears, beads and bead wax, prevented unraveling secrets. There was a snippet there about plaiting her hair. And it made me think though, um, as well, about activism and usually black women and what we, what we give up, what we sacrifice, um, just through listening to the stories through that archive, these poems, this poem was, was written. All rusty, by the way, all this needs work, but don't judge me, please. Activists. We turn up, rally a crowd, march our souls till burning sore on cold streets. We cook the rice and peas for family functions, visit the elderly, cane row your children's hair, part, part grease with pride. We sing our dead to earth, bury them harmonised, we break your fall. Find, we find the lost nephew and nieces, fold them into the family, pattern steps to your broken beats. We bring the hype, when needed, when not. Sew scraps into fashion, dinners of off, dinners of cut feet and backs become seasoned, licked plate goodness. We trailblaze the pathway for you to follow. We archive recipes with our muscles. We clash colours on an ordinary day. We gold hoop our way through. Imagine if we stopped. We tend to black culture like the most precious vegetable garden. But who harvests the fruit? Okay, this is my last slide. So what's next? Um, More? <laughs> I'm, I'm not even, I haven't even scratched the surface of this project really. There's so much more. As you can imagine, 500 years of history, where do I stop? I don't know, I don't know. Where do I stop? But um, my next trip to an archive is the National Archive, where I want to look into the Indian indentured labourers. My grandma is Jamaican Indian. Um, our ancestors, her great 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 grand, her great great grandma came from India as an indentured labourer, and I was looking on the National Archives, um, and they have in, this information on Indian people. Sometimes this is all it is, but sometimes that's all I need, <laughs> and I'll create something from it, right? So, um, so I'm planning on the next month or so. So in their online catalogue, I was able to find out reports of executions of a black man named Robert Johnson and Cawley, what Cawley is a, is a geography name for Indian people, <coughs> sorry, then Agnes Hire and two Cawley men named Ilihi and Puncha Singh for the murder of a Cawley man named Gobadan. Already that's a whole film right there, right? The last one here. Um, arrival of immigrants at Sab Sabana Lamar on board Bemis carried 378 coolies, I hate that word, but that's what it says, and 47 Africans who embarked at St. Helena. Helena. 55 Indian immigrants died from cholera during passage. So I'll be researching the Indian indentured labourers. Is that the last slide? Um, basically, um, traditional archives, photo albums, Instagram. So these images are from the Caribbean photo archive, which you know, helped me shape the writing. I really do love photographs. Um, you can see the, the person, you see people are living, even though, yes, what's been framed, who's framed it, who's, who's positioned it, um, what they missed out, how they edited it. But still, if we read between the lines, we see the human, and I love this image here, this, woman, this Higley woman in Jamaica, I think, 18, 1878, I think that one, <coughs> in Coronation Market. 
I'm writing a story on her at the moment. And um, this Indian woman in Trinidad, uh, to me, but similar, Jamaica, um, indigenous neighbourers. So yeah, my, my question is though, is like, yeah, these are all archive images, but times are changing. So if your family photo album is also an archive, right? You've got, it's got an image, you've got stories in there. What about Instagram, right? People are archiving all the time. People, maybe not in a professional sense, but we're, we're storing images. And I've written quite a few stories from Instagram photographs I've seen and things, which I won't share now because time is ticking. But um, so social media has made everyone who uses the platform into some sort of archivist, which I think is quite slightly true. Going back to what I said before about um, history belongs to no one and everyone. So, um, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're very lucky, obviously, to be speaking with Ioni, um, who you've just heard one from. But we also have Jenny um, Gladell as well, who is the exhibitions officer here at Lincoln Museum who um, can also offer a um, assist, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't get my words out now. Uh, from perspective. her perspective, thank are. you, Ioni. Right. Um, uh, as someone who works with, with archives and with the museum, really, um, in depth, from that perspective. Um, I've got a few questions here, which I'm going to open out to you guys, and then we'll open it out to you. Um, people here if you do have other questions. So my first question was quite a practical one. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you recommend artists get in touch with archives or museums if they wish and they wish to draw from them and work with them? I've been talking for a long time, so let's hear someone else's voice. It's interesting to hear from, I mean, I'm going to speak from the museum's perspective. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to hear, to hear from an artist because, mm -hmm. you know, we, as a museum, we try and be as, as open as, as possible, but obviously we're limited by yeah. resources and staff time. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's not, um, we don't have all the time in the world. But, um, yeah, from our perspective, how we would recommend artists approaching um, museums uh, and archives is um, often, so there's, there's formal ways. We work with an archive, Lincolnshire Archives is open to the public and people can come in and access that. Uh, you can come in and do your own research and it's self-led um, on specific days. Um, but if you kind of have projects and things that you're particularly interested in, we do have a, a research structure where you kind of can approach our collections, curators. Um, there is always a delay. People are always waiting for um, for access because we do get lots of requests. So yeah. yeah, I can imagine that yeah, you, know, yeah. you know this. Uh, you've got to be quite patient. But I, think, I think I'd always recommend just kind of getting get your hands on things to start off with and, and, and seeing what you can access first. Definitely. Yeah. yeah I, I found um, a number of ways Go into the go into the archive or museum and see the public um, galleries. What have they got on show without having to bother anyone or ask it permission first? And sometimes something can be there. But if it's specific, um, like um, British Newspaper Archive and the National Archive, that usually have some sort of online database these days where you can search their collection. And sometimes you can get quite a lot from that. Like I wrote a whole story from the <laughs> Liverpool Slavery Museums information. Um, so that's a way in and it helps to plan your time wisely as well because usually when you do get access to an archive you've got like a slot right so and then so much you want to do but by looking online first and planning what you want to see um, you can use your time wisely. I'm I'm saying that at hindsight because I've been there oh this is interesting and look at this and, and then you, you, you end up not reading anything that like you plan to read and so have a list contact the um, museums and archives, find the curator and managers. And usually they're lovely people. Like I've never I've, I've never I've always had fantastic relationships with the museums and archives I've worked with. Um, they're usually quite happy that people are interested in their research and want to see it. It's just time, isn't it? And um, 
Um, so plan your journey, plan, your, plan what you want to see, make contact with them, explain what your project is about, give them time to respond, and um, yeah, have fun. Can I, ask, can I ask a question? Yeah, right. of course. So when you go into an archive, yeah. what kind of, you say plan, what do you prepare before you go in? All right, yeah. so for instance, even going back to that practically, if you go back to this one, the National um, Archives, these are things I've seen on the online database, like I've, I've typed here, I've spent a whole day typing the word, keywords in, and um, a whole list, like this is just three, three examples have come up. So I know when I go there, when I contact the curator, I'm saying I'm interested in seeing these three things, and anything else on this subject, so maybe you can direct me to something. <coughs> so that's what I mean by um, researching or planning. Or, yeah, sometimes when I went down to the Black Cultural Archives to research on Olive Morris, um, I'm, I'm doing this project, and the creator was lovely, said, give me a bit of time, I can go through and I can suggest things for you to look at. Um, but yeah. Do you take any specific tools with you when you go into an archive? Usually my mm -hmm. iPad, um, or as permission, you can take photographs. Um, and some water and a good pat lunch, because I'm usually <laughs> there for a while. <laughs> usually there for a while. Like when I was at um, Lambeth Archive, I was there for a good six hours. And when I left, the um, creator was like, no one's ever stayed that long. Like, we expected you to stay like half an hour, and we didn't know you were going to go that deep. And I was like, I was so comfortable. I was like, had my, um, had my packed lunch, went out, had my lunch, came back, and just sat there listening to all these wonderful interviews. Um, it, it consumes you, well, me anyway. It con it comes, this research is so rich. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, so, my next question was, uh, when artists work with pre-existing materials, yeah. whether that's um, photographs or whether it's texts, um, what, kind, what would you recommend they do to reference or ensure good practice because they're drawing from pre-existing material? I know there's certain kind of rules or um, different things that you know from your experiences. Um. So, I suppose when my collection is all you know, published, when I've got to that stage where I'm, I'm putting everything together, at the, at the back of the um, collection, I'll have a list of places where I've conducted my research. Um, but there are particular poetry forms, like the golden shovel, which is, a, is a, I suppose, is a way of, cit of citation. It's like where you, you, you get a line of an existing poem and you use that line in your new poem. So each word of that line will form the last word of each line of your new poem. And by doing so, you're kind of like um, challenge, inviting the reader to go and read the original poem to see what's inspired you. So that's one form of poetry that actually is like a citation. Um, it's called a golden shovel. Um, so that's one way, but I think um, sometimes you read poems and you want to respond to that poem, so you might write, Mimba's hands um, inspired by some such a poem or something. And it's always good practice, because it's also like leaving those clues, like I said before, for the reader to go along, like a, a roadmap, so they can follow your train of thought and form their own um, trend of thought as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we were talking about that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That sounds like yeah, a really nice technique, a really interesting technique. Um, I think uh, it's really hard, isn't it? Because appropriation is kind of is important to every every artistic practice, and I think it's um, well to a lot of artistic practice. I think. Um, when you're working in archives and with resource material, you're drawing inspiration from all over, aren't you? Definitely. Um, so it's a, it's a minefield and there's many, many questions around it, but um, from a sort of archival perspective, I'd always say, yeah, ch check your references, make sure that you're um, referencing 
the original source material if, if um, you need to. The archivists and the museum professionals who you are going to work with will be able to guide you on that. Yeah. Um, the research thing is sort of fair use policy within um, within artistic practice, you know, with the acknowledgement that appropriation and inspiration comes from everywhere. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's a tricky one. There aren't there are copyright laws um, that uh, apply. Not to there for things. a reason. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that protect and protect yeah. artists yeah. as well, which yeah, yeah. is really important. So uh, we could talk about it. We could do a whole another two hours Definitely. talking yeah, about yeah. copyright, couldn't we? But um, I think if in doubt, ask ask the archivist. Yeah, kind yeah. of. I mean, I'd be respect. horrified if I knew one of my poems was has been appropriate or stolen from someone else and been used. So. But if someone uses a line from my poem and a golden shovel, it'll be like a bit of like, oh, kind of a um, something to celebrate. So I think most people would be um, delighted that their work has inspired new work. But just you know, contact them or contact go through the correct channels, uh, make sure they get their royalties if they use that type of thing. Um, most definitely. Mm. Um, one of the things that, when you were speaking about your work, and one of the things I thought previously as well, in terms of, um, I love how you breathe life into um, people that, yeah, give people kind of life and a story extended. Yeah. Um, and also start to fill those gaps like you were talking about in terms of what is kept um, and um, what is kind of perceived as being important for an archive but then filling those gaps or filling like filling like breathing life into these people again yeah, yeah. Um, and giving them kind of a second life um, for us and I wondered if um, you could speak a little bit about maybe how artists could find a topic or a focus through the archive mm. um, and how that kind of, how your process, um, yeah, how you do that within your process yeah. um, or possibly your experience as well of how other people have done that as well. Yeah. I think that question was clear. So yeah, very clear. So my process is very personal. I've got a personal connection with Jamaica. So my sinuses have closed up, it's probably hay fever. So it's quite a personal one. Um, my family are Jamaican, I lived and worked on the island. I had a personal tragedy there, which led me into um, researching female experience, female experience, women's experiences of, of Jamaica. But I have to say for artists, if you're looking at archives and book museums, what are you drawn to personally? Like, what are you? What speaks to you? What What are you passionate about? Um, and go with that. Um, this project has taken and will continue to take hard, large chunks of my time and life. So whatever you do, if you put that much time into it, love it. Be passionate about it. So, I think the first way, the initial step is follow your interests. Um, sorry, my nose is gone. <laughs> so yeah, there we go. Yeah, I think that's um, yeah, that's really great to hear. I think also in terms of research, yeah, you're you're spending such a long time with these mm. things, aren't you? It's, yeah. You need to be passionate about it. Um, I don't know because I'm not an artist, so I don't really know. But I think from working with artists um, and working in our archives and. Uh, sort of watching artists work in our archives, it's fascinating to see how they bring out different stories that aren't necessarily what, I think the benefit of working with artists in, in yeah. the museum and our museum archives is that these new stories are opened up and these new perspectives are brought to these different collections. Um, I was talking to some artists who were working with the Tennyson Research Archive, which is part of a, like a little subsection of our major archive. Um, and yeah, it's called the Tennyson, Ten Tennyson Research Archive, and it's uh, all celebrating Alfred Tennyson's history. He was um, a Victorian poet and a big name within Lincolnshire. Um, but actually, the fascinating stories that these artists, these three different artists, brought out that you know you hear this figurehead, this white male figurehead that is named after, um, 
but actually there's so many different people in this archive, there's yeah. so many different stories that as a museum we're limited about how we can tell these stories because yeah. uh, it's, it's so difficult to, yeah. to present that multiplicity. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I think as well, it's um, museums and archives and artists, they need each other. Like, mm -hmm. um, they are like vital organs of, the, of a bigger body. Um, for instance, if it was like, I was in um, Lake District a couple of weeks ago and they've got the, the pencil museum there. So there's a museum archive for anything you want, right? <laughs> and you might think, it's a pencil, right? But someone's crafted that pencil. Who's used that pencil? Where did the lead come from? What, how was the wood grown on what land to create that pencil? Already the store is there. Because whose land did that belong to that we should have created the pencil? Um, who was that right person writing to? What was their life? So already there, yes, it's, it's a pencil, but it's much more than that. It's like I said, it's a piece of someone's history, it's a little clue that you have to spend a bit of time and a bit of imagination and you mm. will get to a personal connection there. I think that's what it is. Making personal connections, um, bringing stories to life. Um, so yeah, it might just be on the front of it, a pencil museum, and like, yeah, so what? But no, it's, there's so much life there. There's, mm. there's, everyone go down to the pencil museum, okay? <laughs> um, you find that story. Um, so this is this is my last question. So get ready. If you do have questions, please um, start thinking of them now and and get brave with your hands to put your hands up. Um, and this this one is probably, it might be really quick. I I don't know. But um, do you have any tips or tricks for artists who would like to work with archives, like something we haven't covered already mm. that you think is really important to kind of say? Not really. I think I've, I've said it before. Like follow your passion. What are you interested in? And trust me, there's an archive on it. <laughs> there, there'll be some archive somewhere. Um, online resources now are um, making archives more accessible. Um, yeah, just, just follow your interests, follow your passions, and read between the lines. Yeah, just look beyond the face value of something. There's, there's always a personal story behind an object, an art, an artifact, whatever it is. There's always someone there that, that has a voice. No, I think that covers everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank Excellent. You. Does anyone else, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind if I come in and you say it in the mic? Oh. Video? I'm sorry, <laughs> I know. Deal breaker. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's very simple. When you're um, researching a person or an event, uh, when do you know when to stop? That's a good question. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when to stop. But I, I imagine, um, like, for instance, remember's hands, I, I, I researched for months, and it felt, it felt it came to an end. It felt like, okay, that's what I remember needs to say. Maybe I'll go back to that research and take a different angle. Mm -hmm. um, but poets will often say, will often say, when is a poem finished? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, things that I've performed today, I'm, I'm reading it out loud and thinking, oh no, I'll go back and edit that later. <laughs> so, does, what I would say to that is make sure you file your things carefully online. So when you want to go back, it's there because I don't know when it's finished. Um, it's a journey that you have to enjoy going on. So when, when you when you had it off, when you get off mm -hmm. the bus, I suppose, that's when it finishes. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Hello. Um, so I work in the you know heritage sector, and I know we've been talking about you know archives, collections, yeah. um, and how there's limits to staffing and you know resources. Do you have any tips on how we can share our you know collections more? And increase engagement and get you know people like you visiting us because I think what you shared is wonderful because these are stories that wouldn't have been shared with us if you yeah. hadn't have taken the time. Um, but what can we do? Like, I know it's a big kind of no, no, big question, but do you have any like quick kind of tips? Yes, <laughs> I do. So for instance, last year when I was uh, working with the National Civil War Centre, they they had a small 
a tiny pot of money and they had an artisan residence. Mm. Residences. Um, a, you know, that's a good way of getting artists in um, to, and it could be not just poets, like painters, sculptors, um, dance um, practitioners. Um, we will find a way to respond to your items. Just give us residency mm. and a bit of money, like it just funds out there. But yeah, I think residencies are a really great way of, of engaging artists because we, we can get the stories out there. You have the, the ingredients we can make into a cake, right? So I think um, um, like national, the Heritage Lottery Funds and all these other funds, the hard to get these grants, they, um, I know. There are pots of money out there though where, where archives and museums can liaise and, and um, employ, contract artists to come in and, and spend time there and create. Artists love to create. I mean, even better when we get paid to do it. So <laughs> let's, let's get this moving. Let's get residences. Let's give um, commissions. Um, yeah, that's a good way to start. That's OK. I've really enjoyed the talk. It's, it's been really wonderful Thank you. speaking about your practice. You know, a lot of it, it must be quite painful. So I wonder what is your advice for other artists working in archives? How do you practice self-care when you're dealing with these stories? Ooh. And you, I imagine that you go and you don't always know what you're going to find out. And yeah. sometimes, like, Rimba's hands, it's going to be very emotive and upsetting. Yeah. And, you know, how do you look after yourself as an artist? When you're going through this process. That's a good something I'm, just, I'm I'm working on right now. How do I look after myself? Breaks, time out. But I think um, yes, it's it's painful, it's heartbreaking, tragic to read some of these histories. But there's some solace in creating the art, like for Ole Glynn, for Mimba's hand, for Mimba, for um, all these other women, we're giving them a second chance, or even a chance, to have a story. Um, I often say I feel like a some sort of clairvoyance or medium, like, remember, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to... And it's kind of... It is painful, it, it is heartbreaking, and it's... Yeah, I've had, I've had nightmares, I've had, um, I've had to step away, I've had to take time breaks, um, eat well, go on a retreat, go for walks, get counselling, have some good friends, um, go for swims, <laughs> um, but keep making your art. Keep making your art. That's, that's the best thing. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I will thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, this might be a bit repetitive because like um. I'll just say it. Ask something. it, and I'll find out. Yeah. Um. So. Um, with how like you have to read in between the lines, and especially like content like yours, where it can be like quite personal and um sensitive. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with like the pressure of having to? get that interpretation right because it's it's such a big personal yeah. thing and you don't want to just put out this piece yeah. and contribute to all the other people who have just misrepresented that, yeah. that history or that yeah, yeah. It, there, there is a responsibility there as artists um especially when you're dealing with um, just sensitive history. Um, how do I? I think be, be honest with yourself and be aware of your own biases, your own unconscious biases. I mean, it's unconscious, so how can you be aware of it? But lots of reflection and reflect on yourself. What am I saying? Am I um, am I just adding to the stereotype? Well, what am I adding? That's a good question. What am I adding by writing this piece? Um, what am I um, contributing? 
to the landscape that's already there. So it's important to try and read widely, to look at other artists, how are they working? Um, am I being repetitive? Am I just copying someone else on, um, on knowing me? And I think by, by doing that and reflecting and having integrity with your work, um, so if you are questioned or challenged, you can say honestly, I can say honestly, all these poems I've, I've written with as much research as I could, with um, my heart and my brain, so I can stand up next to them and say, you know, I think I'm adding something. <coughs> I think I'm adding something to a landscape uh, that maybe hasn't been heard from this angle. Well, there is, there is a whole huge responsibility. So what, what I'll say to that is, we need more, more artists, we need diverse voices to, to represent or re-represent -re history. So then we are giving this, um, so we have a diverse landscape, we have a diverse, I'm not saying, but the more voices we have to, to speak from different perspectives, different agendas, personal experiences, who can add to the, the mix of history and representing history, I think that would be the, the best way to share the burden. Not, so not just on one person. You don't just want to be the, the, the token Jamaican black British person to write the whole of Caribbean history. That's, that's when it becomes a burden, right? Because there's one person doing it. But if you've got like a good amount of people who are representing Jamaica or representing England or whatever it is, we can share that burden. Um, so this is going back to archives museums. If you are thinking about having residencies and commissions for artists, or any organisation employing people, think about diverse voices, right? The, the, the token person is hell for the person and it often doesn't end well. So this is why having diverse people um, of age, race, sexuality, all diversity, the diversity in all its, its mul multiplicities will help to have a, a healthy um, response unhealthy life. There, that's my answer. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I had a question, that's all right. Okay. Basically just reaching out to communities, but it's, it's so small that you don't know where, they where are. to look, yeah. Um, reaching out to communities who are hard to find, how to reach them. Make your art anyway, and they'll come to you. They'll find you. Um, are you talking about a particular community? Tell me. Are you, are you talking about a particular community or your, your own experience? Is that what this is? No. no. Okay. Yeah, sorry. No, it's okay. I would, I would say make your art regardless. Start somewhere. Start anywhere. And you'd be surprised how things synchronise in the line. Make your art and you will find the people. You find outlets and um, contact contact arts organisations, galleries, and say, "Can I present my work with you?" Um, I suppose having multiple platforms where your art is available, accessible, that's a way for people to access your art. So um, I think don't feel I don't know the, the burden of trying to reach your people. You kind of have to let go of that when you're making the art. You kind of have to make the art first. I don't, is that under the question? I don't know. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah, thank you. Sorry that I raised no it. It's okay. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about archives recently, and obviously I'm going to be doing work from archives. And as someone who does that, um, if you were going to be contributing something into an archive mm -hmm. for someone to discover about you, what would you want archived about yourself? Oh, what would I deposit into an archive? Um, some writing, um, um, some earrings. 
Something about jewelry. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, parents yeah. And, and jewelry, I think. Yeah. I love the earrings today. Thank so you. Really <laughs> um, we're going to close the questions there. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has come. Thank you so much, Jenny, as well, for contributing to um, the Q&A. But obviously, most of all, thank you, Ioni, for Aww. the talk and um, also all the insights that you've given in the Q&A and the talks. It's been, and also the performances as well that oh, you've shared you with us in your writing, which has been really special. So thank, thank you for you having me. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for these people online. Thank you for the audience. Yeah. Everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Let's give uh, one last applause, please, there.